were many. He began life as a gentleman's baby, a situation he filled for about three years with much credit. When he found himself presented to the rank and standing of a gentleman's little boy. He passed through the various grades of boyhood and adolescence without distinguishing himself and having developed no prominent characteristic of any kind whatever. At 19, finding himself penniless, he enlisted in a regiment of Highlanders. He served with some distinction as a soldier for about three days. But the brutality of the regimental barber disgusted him and he abruptly quitted the service. Now, 13 years later, Freddie Fogarty was in a very uncomfortable frame of mind. A sergeant of Highlanders had that morning entered the shop to purchase some acidulated drops and had stared at him in a remarkable manner. It's lucky for you, Sergeant, that it's me you're staring at so rudely, and not my wife, for she is strong and stands no nonsense. Upon which he remarked that it was a fine morning, which it was not, as it had been snowing heavily, and went out of the shop, leaving his acidulated drops behind him in his nervous agitation. Suddenly, Freddy recollected that this very sergeant was very like the very sergeant who had enlisted him some 13 years before, which caused him to use the exclamation with which our story opens. Oh, dash it all, he knows me, and I should be tried for desertion, and I should be dragged away from my wife and children and my little shop and be forced to serve out my time in the ranks. Oh, it's too much. It's too, too much. Turn up, Mr. Pocketeer. <laughs> who said that? See anybody? Here, Mr. Fogarty, on the twelfth cake. At last, his eyes rested on a small twelfth cake in the window, and he was surprised to see the little plaster of Paris fairy, which crowned the top of it, hop off her box of sugar plums and pick her way carefully through the tracery which decorated the surface of the cake. She travelled on slowly tumbling over a harlequin and getting her skirt caught in the fringe of a gelatine cracker until she reached the edge. I'm afraid, Mr. Fogarty, that it's too high to jump. Would you kindly let me step onto your hand? Uh, we have magnified the following scene for the purposes of our illustration. <laughs> Well, miss, about 13 years ago I enlisted, and three days later I deserted, and I've just been discovered, and am now to be caught, tried, and perhaps forced to serve out my time in the army. Oh, indeed, that would be a pity, for from what I have heard of Mrs. Fogarty, she will not do the shop justice. She has no taste for business. Oh, Louisa is all heart. She cannot stand the idea of selling anything. I wish you would tell me your history. With pleasure, miss. And he told her his history, much as I'm telling it to you now, only with more detail and all of the key events handily summarised in the form of this chart. Goodness! It seems to me, Mr. Fogarty, that your career has been a very discreditable one. I'm not proud of it, miss. 
It was very naughty of you to stow away on that ship like that. Yes, miss, but what else could I do? Uh, besides, if I'd not stowed away, I would never reached America and met my darling Louisa. And if I'd stayed in England, I was bound to be captured and court-martialed. Instead, as a stowaway, you were captured but tarred and feathered, which was worse. Ah, yeah, yes, miss, but think. If I hadn't been tarred and feathered, I never would have met my darling Louisa, for it was her father, the charitable Reverend Hicks K. Clappy, who took pity on me and scraped me down, bless his heart. If you were so fond of this Reverend Hicks K. Plappy, why did you tell him that you were the Duke of Northumberland? Well, if I hadn't told him I was the Duke of Northumberland, he'd never scrape me down. People don't go around scraping down just anybody, you know. <laughs> Besides, if I hadn't said that, Louisa would have never agreed to marry me nor move to England. I can only guess at her disappointment when she learned that you are not the Duke of Northumberland. You are not the Duke of Northumberland, are you? No, miss, I am not. But Louisa still thinks I am. I've told her that the real Duke of Northumberland is an imposter and I am laying low under the guise of a South London confectioner in order to watch his moves. Oh, you are wicked, Mr Fogarty. There's no other word for it. It's wicked. Oh. I'm not sure I should help you. Please, miss. Please help if you can. There's much about my past I regret. So save for my, my little shop, my wife and children. There are many incidents in my past I would give anything to wipe out. Oh, indeed. Well, I think I can help you do that. First of all, how many ornaments are there on this 12th cake? Well, there are three big ones. There's the ship, uh, the harlequin and the policeman. Very good. Now take these ornaments. And whenever you wish to obliterate any one deed of your life and all its consequences, eat one of them. Well, and the deed will be obliterated for my life completely? Entirely. You will be as though it had never been committed. Oh, oh. very much obliged to you, miss. Isn't Not it? at all. Very glad to be able to assist you. And so saying, she made her way to the bonbon box top of the cake and became plaster of Paris once more. Fanny scarcely knew what to make of this adventure. I scarcely know what to make of this adventure. <laughs> he was not so foolish as to believe in fairies, but still, without committing himself to a belief, there she was. As his mind was turning over, he looked down the street and saw a corporal's guard in the distance. He was marching straight towards the shop. Oh. Oh, it's too awful. I shall be arrested and torn away from my shop and wife and two fine children. No! No! Drowning men catch at straws and Freddy clutched the ship. Uh, I wish... I wish that my return from America and all its consequences are obliterated from my history forever! Uh, to enlighten him as to the circumstances in which he found himself. Great masts, two long carronades, about 800 tonnage. Oh, I'm on a ship. Come on, I come. Uh, with a breeze like this, I reckon we shall take tarnation shakes out of the old British. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. And, and where is um, yon British? About three miles up starboard quarter. Uh, ooh, um, Starboard cup! Oh, yes, the, the other star. Yes. Uh, <laughs> ah, yes, yes, I, I, I see it. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, him, which is, say her. I, I see her. If this breeze lasts, she'll never overhaul the flying cloud. Oh, well, if she should, who cares? <laughs> oh, I do for one. And the crew do for another. And the cargo do for a third. The cargo? I don't see how it can concern the cargo. What? <laughs> oh, that is a good one. <laughs> oh, don't see how I can concern the gargle. <laughs> oh, bully for you, old man. <laughs> bully for me, as you say. Oh, you do make me laugh. 
Oh, can't concern the cargo. <laughs> Why, you never beat that if you try to year. <laughs> I think I should like to take another look at the cargo. Wilps! Captain wants another look at the cargo. Welps is a long way away today, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Well, once the farmers take the wheel on the list. Good, that's good. The boatswain lighted with a lantern. <laughs> and they descended to the lower deck. At this point, Freddy perceived that the atmosphere had a distinct and recognisable flavour of its own. He descended a second ladder and formed his first impression of the cargo. As his eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, he saw that the hold contained from 40 to 50 people of both sexes huddled together in a dreadfully uncomfortable manner. Slaves! These are slaves! They were chained two and two, the chain of communication running through a staple in the deck. I'm a slaver! I'm a black murder! That's why the other ship is in pursuit! How can this have happened? Think, Freddy. Think. Uh, now, I'll have to look at my handy chart. Uh, now, if I'd never returned from America, I never would have uh, made the acquaintance of the Reverend Hicks K. Plappy. Not at all. No, I would have been able to stay for some time at his pecking speculative bounty. Uh, but, however, eventually, his suspicions would have become aroused as to my pretensions towards the dukedom of Northumberland. Ha <laughs> ha, yes, of course. The result? Six months choking. Whilst in prison, I would perhaps have made the acquaintance of a seafaring man of evil countenance, who, upon our release, would have acquired for me the lowly position of crewman aboard a blockade runner. In that position, I would have acquitted myself so remarkably, the promotion would have been rapid, and at the end of the American War, I would have saved enough money to purchase the flying clam out and out, using her to trade in slavery as being more profitable than that in gold or ivory. Yes, of course, that is obvious. <laughs> it all makes perfect sense. But what of my darling Louisa? No doubt, uh, no doubt living luxuriously somewhere in Florida under the impression that her husband is a blameless merchant. There, there been the cargo cap. How awful, how terrible, those poor devils torn away from their families and cramped and crippled in a stinking hold in an atmosphere in which a candle will hardly burn. It's terrible. It's appalling. <clears throat> I'll be sure, be sure to tell the second mate that. <laughs> Shut the poor devils up again. Uh, that's right. Now, over here, Captain. <laughs> this be the slow match. Oh, yes, the uh, the slow match. It's a beautiful order. Mm. Burns two minutes. Oh, and, and, and where is the other end attached to? What? To an open barrel of powder in the magazine. I got it to your own orders, Captain. My orders? I mean, yeah, my orders, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> and let us see how well uh, you remember my orders. When are you to light it? As soon as the finisher's first drop strikes a hole, then up we goes. And there's an end of the flying farm crew, cargo, cabin and all. <laughs> oh, 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 uh, admirable. Uh, only uh, I've been thinking, isn't there something uh, rather despicable, if not to say downright cowardly, in this relatively straightforward and painless way of avoiding any punishment our captors would have for us? Uh, no, no. Let us rather instead show our indifference to penal servitude by bravely and immediately... Surrendering. What's this of all the old pen? Oh, stop a bit, stop a bit. All hands on deck! All hands on deck! And all, look here. This here, Captain of Arm. This here, white liver devil's chicken. He's showing the white feather. He's a cur, a slinky coward. He won't fight and he won't sing. He's going to give it meat if you let him, if you let him. Uh, don't know, man, I promise you. Nothing can be further from the truth. Uh, what's this? Look here, Captain. What's your program? What do you propose to do? Um. Bang! From the Britisher. The shot, a 32, flew high over their heads, bringing down one of the main topsail lifts. Boxing? Aye, aye. Take charge of the slow match. When I give the word go, light it. Aye, aye, Captain. The wind had freshened considerably, and the British frigates came up hand over hand. Carpenter! Aye, aye, sir! 
Stave in the boats. Do it or I'll blow your woolly head off. Boatswain's mate. Aye, aye, sir. Can't you take any more sail? No, sir. I'll put some blooming clothes on. The British have rapidly overhauled the slaver because the breeze had by now increased to half a gale. At length, a round shot carried away the mizzen. Two men were carried overboard of it. Boatswain. Aye, aye. Go. Go. It is. The man is fired, and in two minutes we shall be blown to feathers. And so saying, he threw himself overboard. An example which was followed by the greater part of the crew. Then he counted down the seconds on his watch. 32, 31, 30. Oh, at least we'll save the cargo. Um, oh, I now wish, I now wish that my towering and feathering and all the consequences that sprang from it are eradicated from my history forever! Um. between a large, well-appointed office and a particularly luxurious study. Beneath his feet was an axman stove of quite astonishing power, on which stood a heavy writing table, furnished with every little luxury that can reduce the toil and enhance the pleasures of penwork. Oh, it's perfectly clear I'm a clerk in a bank of some kind. I wonder what kind of bank it is. Quite a substantial one by the looks of it. Uh, Oh, well, what's still more likely, a flashy but insubstantial one. Uh, let's see, a Royal and Delible Bank, 142 Threadneedle Street. Oh, Royal and Delible Bank, Royal and Delible Bank. Well, well, I suppose then this must be the Royal and Delible Bank. I wonder what lies behind yonder doorway. What met Freddy's eyes was a very large chamber filled with little desks at which 40 or 50 clerks were busy at work. At the sight of Fogarty, they all turned and looked at him. Ah. Well, carry on. Can't be blowed. I'm a banker, by Jove, and a dash successful one, too. <laughs> at that moment, the clock struck five, and all the clerks rose simultaneously in twos and threes and fired out, saying, Good evening, sir, very respectfully, as they went by. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, good evening. Well, I suppose I'd better go home as well. I wonder where I live. <clears throat> good evening, sir. Now, nah. oh, well, I can hardly ask this porter where I live. He'll think I've been drinking. <laughs> Your carriage awaits, sir. Ooh. A quiet bum, hold up. Drawn by a pair of handsome greys. <laughs> Ooh, lovely. Home, please, my good man. <laughs> this is better. This is something like a uh, good position in a substantial bank, or at least I hope it's a substantial bank, and a brougham and pair to take me home to where? A snug villa in Regent's Park, perhaps, or, or a good house in Bedford Square with my darling Louisa and the children waiting for me. Ah, oh, my dear Louisa. I wonder how she's looking. Oh, hang on a minute. Oxford Street? Ah, oh, well, it won't be Bedford Square. Ah, oh, good. I never liked Bedford Square. Regent's Park it is. Always preferred Regent's Park. Oh, by the by, I wonder what I'm earning. Ah, a pocketbook. Let's see. Uh, oh, it all seems to be in some kind of code. <laughs> Hope I can find the key to it. I shall get into a mess. Oh, here we go. Something intelligible. September the 29th, quarter's salary, £375. Ooh, £1,500 a year, eh? Well, not bad. Quote coaching horses can't be had on that, though. Or anything near. Oh, I hope I'm not uh, overspending. Oh, perhaps Louise's coming to inheritance. Yes, of course. That will be it. Uh, well, uh, hang on a minute. Bayswater? Oh, Bayswater? I'm not living in Bayswater. If it's Bayswater, I'm moving tomorrow. Oh, good, good. Lancaster Gate. What a relief. Uh, Hang on a minute, Freddie. Lancaster the gate can't be done. 
1,500 pounds a year or anything like. Something's very wrong here, Freddie. Something's very wrong indeed, I'm afraid. The door was opened by a grave man in handsome livery. And Freddie entered the house with much misgiving. Hello? Hello, anybody home? Only my lady, sir. Ah, well, only your lady? Her ladyship, Sir Frederick. She waits upstairs. <laughs> Sir Frederick! <laughs> I'm a knight! <laughs> oh, oh, I hope I'm a baronet. If only for Louisa's sake. Women care so much about these things. <laughs> and uh, this arrived for you, sir. Oh, see. Uh, Sir Frederick Poverty, Lancaster Gate. Oh, I'm just a knight. Oh, well, um, time to go and surprise Louisa and the children. <laughs> A hero ran upstairs without stopping to examine the portraits in the hall or the handsome bust of himself on the first landing and entered a dressing room. Darling, darling, I'm home. Where are you, darling? <laughs> you hiding yourself from me? Darling. Ah, oh, 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 I'm terribly sorry. See, I thought, well, I, I was told. Come in, darling, come in. I'm so glad you're home early. Um. Um, There's nothing wrong with the city, dear. Oh, uh, what? Uh, no, no, nothing whatever, uh, dear. That's right. You wouldn't have a secret from your little wifey, would you? Mwah. On this day, too, of all others. Wifey! She's my wife! <laughs> think, Freddy, think! How can this have happened? Oh, um, if I'd never been tarred and feathered, I never would have met the Reverend Hicks Cape Mappy, nor his daughter Louisa. Presumably, therefore, I would have married some other personage to wit. This buxom, red-faced, heavily bearded personage I've never seen before this moment. Oh, oh, my poor Louisa. My poor dear Louisa. And the children. The poor darling children. She'll never see them again. Freddie, are you sure you're quite well? What? Are you sure you're well, dear? Oh, uh, yes. Perfectly fine, thank you, um, dear. I'm glad to hear it. We wouldn't want that on this day of all others. Now, run along, you'd better change for dinner. Uh, yes, yes, of course. <clears throat> That's way. Well. Oh, yes, how silly of me. Fenny repaired to a luxuriously furnished dressing room. And as he dressed, he thought to himself as follows. Suppose, on reflection, this exchange of life has not worked out too badly. I've changed from a life of perpetual fear, lawlessness and peril to a, one of assured prosperity and social standing. That said, I've exchanged a pretty and ladylike wife for a stout and vulgar one. I wonder what possessed me to marry so vulgar a person. Ah! That's it! Yeah. I married her for her money! Of course, yes. She was a wealthy widow, no doubt, and uh, I married her for her money. Excuse me, sir. A lady says, would you have me please, because some of them have arrived. Well, who's arrived? Uh, Mr and Mrs Portal and Lord Portico. What, it's a dinner party? Isn't that dashed inconvenient? What the devil are we having a dinner party for? Oh, sir! On this day, too, of all others! I don't like to ask what day it is. Finish, finish dressing. Went downstairs, long journey to the drawing room. Very expensive, yes. Yeah. And uh, shook hands very heartily with Lord Porto. Of all others, it really was. Oh, what's his face? In the name of all 
mischief. What day is this? Tuesday, sir. Oh, dash it all, that's no use to me. Won't someone please enlighten me? Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, there are certain occasions when the strict forms of etiquette may be relaxed. I don't think you'll agree with me that this day, of all others, is one of them. What day is it, dash it? Ah, ah. I won't detain you by dilating on the auspicious character of the event we are all here to celebrate the circumstances of which are known to you all. Not to everybody, darn it. Uh, I will merely uh, consent myself in proposing that we drink the health of my very dear old friend, Sir Frederick Fogarty, and uh, to my dear, uh, may I, I still want to offend, his admirable wife. Thank you! Thank you! Speech! What? Oh. Speech! Um, oh, um. <laughs> um. Uh, but my, my, my dear, my, my very dear, but my dear old friend, um. In rising uh, to respond to the toast, uh, which you've been kind enough to attach my name and that of my dear. Uh, my, 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 my dear wife, uh, I, I feel no little embarrassment. <clears throat> it was on this day. Um, no matter how many years ago, it was on this day, of all others, that uh, heaven blessed our union. I, I say, heaven blessed our union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Oh, it, yes, it was on this day, of all others, no matter how many years ago. Four uh, years, uh, only four. Oh, well, uh, four years, um, um, that um, <laughs> my wife and I were married. What's that you say? I, I, I said it was on this day, four years ago, this day of all others, that my wife and I were happily married. Fred, Fred Fogarty, you're drunk! Drunk at your own table! He must be drunk to insult his wife in such a manner. Look at this, sir, she's fainted. You can play along now. Oh, that's all right, thank you. Once you get off a fainting for me, that'd be much appreciated. Now you, just hold your head to one side. Happen, oh, well, there you go, that's it, there you go. Look at this, she's fainted! We are invited here to celebrate the fourth anniversary of the birth of his son and heir. And this insolent joke arises and publicly states that on this day of all others, on this day, and not before this day, he and she were happily married. Oh, I want to stay here another word of it. No, 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 no please, no, please don't go. Uh, uh, no, I, I'm sorry, truly I am, that my poor little joke has been uh, misconstrued so unfortunately. <laughs> let, us, uh, let us all be as merry as if I'd responded in such a way that it melted you all to tears. Is. <laughs> uh, please come, come and come to the retired drawing room. Uh, Telegram, sir. Thank you. What's his face? <laughs> From the Gone Goose Cripplegate to Sir Frederick Fogarty. Crump, Jagger, Punty Boom, Rubble Burby, Calc. And there's two gentlemen waiting in the hall to see you, sir. Well, this is gibberish. Can't they come back later? Uh, I'm afraid not, sir. Ah, oh, well, show me. Crumpf, Jagger, Punty Boom, Rubble Burby, Calc. Is this some kind of code? Sir Fletcher Fogarty? Um, I am he. <laughs> Sorry to trouble you at this time or not, but uh, business is business, sir, as I'm sure you very well understand. My maxim through life. I suppose you can guess that out. Oh, I conclude it's something to do with this. Exactly. So the Gone Goose is in it? Oh, yes, he's in it, yes. He, indeed, he's been in it for some time. Mm. Much applause for the information, sir. Seems for this telegram that we're just in time? Oh, just in time, yes. <laughs> I suppose in another ten minutes you'd have been off? Oh, five, five minutes, but I'm very glad you called me at home. So are we, Sir Frederick. I suppose you'll come quietly. Oh, as a mouse, yes. Do you want me to come with you now, or shall I follow on in a couple of hours? I think it would be more satisfactory if you were to go with us, sir. <laughs> you're a game one, I'll give you that. Tell every man in your position could cut jokes on the brink of penal servitude. Penal attitude? Well, I'm afraid it'll be that, Sir Fetching. I mean, there's the bonds and the two bills on Poxon and Blythe, you know. Forgery? Oh! Oh, this is monstrous! Oh, please, everybody, gather round! Please come, gather round! Oh, Mr. Frederick, 
you, you said you'd come quietly and if you think of a rescue is attempted. Nonsense, I promise I will come quietly. Now listen everybody, this is several degrees too bad. That five hours ago I was a slave trader and at four o'clock this afternoon I was a confectioner on the Borough Road with a wife and two fine children. Now it seems in some previous age when I was not myself but somebody else. Sir Frederick Fogarty forged certain documents and bonds. Uh, get another scaffolding for play a lunacy is it now sir? Come along now. No, I've done nothing wrong. The meeting is coming out. Take me away. They handcuffed him and drove him off to Marlborough Street Police Station. He had no substantial defence, but threw himself at the mercy of the court in a speech which has been preserved in the annals of the Old Bailey as the type of what such a speech should be. <clears throat> My lord and gentlemen of the jury, I cannot deny that I, before I was me, may have been guilty of the charge imputed to me by the learned counsel for the prosecution, to whose very able and very lucid recital of the varied incidents of my career I have listened with much curiosity. But reflect, I have been, for some hours past, the toy and sport of a twelfth cake fair, who tempted me from my original position as a confectioner on the Borough High Road to firstly that of a slave trader and secondly that of a corrupt and fraudulent banker. That fairy gentleman has been the bane of my life. Let it be a warning to you all on the bench, and especially you, my lord, to beware of supernatural assistance. Trust to your own exertions, and you shall all do very well. Now, I'm very much obliged to you all for listening to my case and showing it due consideration. And as I know that you are about to pass a sentence of guilty, the best thing I can do is to make another change to my condition in all due haste. I now wish, I now wish that the 12th Cake Fairy and all the consequences of my acquaintance with her are obliterated from my history forever! And, and behold, Freddy Fogarty found himself once more in the little confection shop on the Moor Road in the act of selling the pulp cake, the policeman, the harlequin, the ship and the fairy to the self-same corporal he had spied across the street. It was perfectly clear, neither he, nor the sergeant, nor anyone involved with my recruitment even vaguely recognised me, and I was safe, for the time being at least. And there, in the back shop, with their darling children was his Louisa. And whenever Fogarty narrated the adventure of the twelfth cake, she indignantly stopped him, telling him that he was a donkey and had been dreaming. Which, I think, was very likely the case. Was on these shores that around our coast from Deal to Ramsgate span that I met alone on a piece of stone an elderly naval man. His hair was weedy and his beard was long and weedy and long was he and I heard that white of the shore recite in a singular minor key. Oh, I am a cook and a captain bold and the mate of the Nancy Brig a boatswain tight and a midship mate and the crew were the captain's gig. And he shook his fists, and he tore his hair. T 
until I was really quite afraid. And I couldn't help thinking that the man had been drinking, and so I simply said, Oh, elderly man, it's little I know of duties of men of the sea, but I'll eat my hand if I understand however you can be at once a cook and a captain bold and the mate of the Nancy's brig and a midshipmite and a boatswain tight and the crew of the captain's gig. So, he gave a hitch to his trousers, which is a trick all seamen learn, and having got rid of a thumping quid, he span this painful yard. Twas in the good ship Nancy Bell that we sailed the Indian Sea. And there on a reef we come to grief, which has often occurred to me. And pretty nigh all the crew was drowned. There were 77 or so. And only 10 of the Nancy's men said here to the master of all. There was me and the cook and a captain bold and the mate of the Nancy Brig. A boatswain tight and the midship mate and the crew of the captain's gig. For a month, we'd neither whittles nor drink, till our hungry we did feel, so we drawed a lot and according shot the captain for our meal. The next lot fell to the Nancy's mate, and a delicate dish he made. Then our appetite with the midship mate, we seven survivors, stayed. Then we murdered the boatswain type, and he much resembled pig. Oh. Then we whittled three to the cook and me, or the crew of the captain's gig. <laughs> then only the cook and me was left. <laughs> and the delicate question, which of us two goes to the kettle? A rose? Were you out in the hour, Sitch? For I loved that cook as a brother I did. And the cook, he worshipped me. But we'd both be blowed if we'd either be stoned in the other chap's hold, he said. I'll be it if he dines on me, says Tom. Yes, that, says I, you'll be. I'll be bold if I die, my friend, quoth I, and exactly so, quoth he. Says he, do James to murder me, what a foolish thing to do. For can't you see, you can't cook me, but I can and will cook you. Now, so we boil some water, and it takes some salt and pepper in portions true, and she never forgot, and some chumchula, and some sage and parsley too. Come here, says he, with a pop of pride, which is smiling features tell. Oh, pleasing be when I let you see how extremely nice you'll smell. So, does it round and round and round and sniffs at the foaming froth. So, I up to his heels and smother his squeals in the scum of the boiling broth. <laughs> <laughs>
return for my own part. I am making undertaking to instruct you in the art, art amazing, wonder raising of a jester, jesting free, high ambition, proposition, and a lively one I'll be. Wagga wagging, never flagging. Wagga wagging, never flagging. Wagga wagging, never flagging. Never wagging, never wagging, never flagging. Tell the tale of cock and bull. Tales demand us and defend us. What a tale of cock and bull! 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 Cock and bull! Cock and bull! And defend us. What a tale of cock and bull! It says no Sullivan. Well, they were obviously lying.